Hi, I'm Louise Harris. I'm one of the co-directors of the Digital Departures Lab here at the University of Glasgow. Recently, I had the opportunity of speaking to Jana Winder about her practice and about how she engages with issues relating to environmental sustainability and acoustic ecology um, within the context of her work. The interview follows here, and as Jana is based in Norway, and we're obviously in the middle of a global pandemic, this had to happen by Zoom. So there is the occasional sort of little section where I pause like this or freeze in unusual um, positions or Yada is maybe speaking and we lose some of her words and unfortunately there's not a huge amount we can do about that but hopefully you'll bear with us. Um, so here we are, my discussion with Jana Winder. My name is Jana Winder. I'm an artist uh, based just um, uh, north of Oslo on a farm. Uh, it's also where I grew up uh, and uh, where my uh, engagement with how we are treating the planet really started on a, in a very early age. I spent a lot of time um, also south of Nor in Norway by the sea and um, I had always been concerned with, for example, you know, here uh, this lake, we had an enormous algae overgrowth in the early 70s. And it was scary to me that, you know, all the fish were dying. You know, it's also where we were taking the drink water from. And, uh, you know, what is it that we are uh, doing? You know? So this has kind of really led uh, everything I've done since, uh, I mean, both uh, I used to study uh, science to become a marine biologist, but uh, I changed to uh, study art in the early, uh, late 80, early 90s at Goldsmiths College in London. Um, so, um, yeah, and uh, since really around then, I have uh, worked with uh, sound as a carrying element in my uh, work, but also um, drawing and installation works and photography has been a large part of my practice. Okay. So um, when you kind of made the, not necessarily the switch, but when you, when you, began working with sound what what sort of precipitated that did you just sort of hear an interesting sound one day and think oh I'm going to kind of go and explore that or, or was there something a bit more kind of formal about what you were doing at the time uh, at the time uh, in Goldsmiths I were making large sculptures and uh, it sort of got to me that I you know I can't keep producing this object uh, into the planet. It didn't make sense for me anymore uh, to leave these objects and uh, create what I was thinking about, you know, like rubbish. I'm actually still uh, having these sculptures around that I made in uh, in Falmouth, like where I did my foundation course, and I don't know what to put them. So, you know, uh, I said to myself, I don't want to have like a massive studio with a lot of um, uh, stuff, you know, that uh, would you know, take up space. And, and I didn't like the idea that you would go to an exhibition and wanting to buy these objects, for example. Uh, I'd rather that you would go away from an exhibition and uh, or from an experience uh, with a memory of, um, and it would live with you as a memory and not uh, as an object. Okay. So you've talked a little bit about um, kind of your interest in, in preserving ecosystems and environments um, since you were a child but was that kind of uh, an active part of what you were doing with sound initially or is it something that's that's developed over time? I think my reason for then changing into more kind of immaterial material also you know working with light and existing um, rooms just moving objects around and then also sound uh, was because of uh, not producing more stuff into the planet and uh, of course that has basis in my thinking about how we are on the planet how we are also with the different creatures we are sharing the planet with um, and the space we are occupying okay so a lot of your work deals with sounds that are that are inaccessible in some way so either we can't hear them without them being sort of rec recorded in a particular way um or physically we just can't we can't access them um where did that obviously that's kind of come from your kind of ecological interests over time but but how did you sort of start working in that way because a lot of um 
sort of visual artists and sculptors, sculptors and what have you will start to work with sound, but it will be in a much more kind of immediately accessible way. So sound that you can just easily record as opposed to, you know, getting at these these tiny little sort of inaudible things. So how did you how did you start exploring sound in that way? I think what uh, I just had this idea that I really wanted to record the sound of a little insect eating a leaf. I okay. Remember, or like a little worm eating a leaf. What does that sound like, you know, chewing away on a, on a leaf? So um, I actually just set myself on this kind of, I want to go out and make the best recording possible of the small sounds that we are not really necessarily noticing from the cre- from creatures we are not uh, necessarily noticing, you know. Um, so, uh, and I had been sitting in a studio and uh, like really falling asleep, kind of uh, just like regurgitating the sound in and out of the speakers, in and out of the computers, and I fell asleep. And it was like, this is not what I want to do. So I wanted to go out there again and, uh, you know, visit, uh, you know, be with the fish and the birds and, you know, and the the worms in the ground and and be out there really and uh, doing what I like to do very much is uh, spending time being outside, of course. And uh, this this made much more sense to me than sitting inside of the studio all the time. So are there sort of, I'm sure there are, but are there um, specific kind of sound events that are that were very memorable so things that were maybe surprising or unexpected or were there are there sort of certain ones that really stick out in your in your mind as oh that was amazing <laughs> <laughs> yes there has been very many totally amazing uh, you know and where I'm going like what <laughs> Yeah, that's here, there, the hydrophones and the waters, like, for example, being inside of a um, shoal, uh, school of fish uh, in Thailand, in uh, China, it was like in the late evening, it was like totally dark, a lot of hydrophones, and it was like a crazy uh, amount of sound, and it was like, like all over the place, everywhere around us, it was just, you know, for example, or even just when I came back from a recording like a long time ago, I was like, okay, it was at three, four in the morning, it started to be light, I was in, Nor- in Norway, and I started to hear this kind of small crackling sound, because I thought I, I was tired, I was time to, you know, have a rest or whatever, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to have one more recording here by the beach, and I started to hear this really, uh, you know, crunching sound, it was like scraping sound. And uh, I realized by moving the hydrophones closer that it was just like little uh, sea um, uh, snails, you know, just moving around the stone. It was like, <laughs> like what? You know, so I think, um, and, and the old underwater insect, I mean, it's endless. You know, the bearded seal, first time I heard it, or this uh, recently a pilot whale with lots of different types of sound. It's so diverse you know, for doing different things, you know, uh, it seems. And, um, you know, so I I would say, I think I actually can say, like, every time I go out, I get totally, you know, wow, <laughs> amazed because I don't get what I expect. Because uh, if I think, remember when I was thinking I, uh, out in the sea ice, for example, I thought I was going to hear the crackling sound of ice, you know, it's, it will have its own character for that place, of course. So I was excited to do it. But I had no idea that I would hear this tone, this sort of, oh, dropping tone of the bearded seal, you know, this was like, what? And then, you know, uh, I could hear uh, them during that trip, I, I kept hearing them, but I didn't see them again. I saw one that first day. Uh, because it was quiet and he was looking at me uh, so above the water but then he dived down again and he starts singing again uh, so um, you know it's it's always exciting you know and I really love my job <laughs> because of it you know it's just uh, it's a sort of never-ending uh, ex- you know in the terms of exploration I like a lot of unknown things. I was reading, like, uh, you know, to a uh, a lot when I was a child. Uh, you know, he went out exploring, not really knowing what he was uh, getting into, you know, he tested out things and stuff like that. So I think that was very inspirational for me at that time. 
So, uh, yeah, I like this kind of unexplored areas and hopefully, uh, you know, putting attention and respect to the, especially to the underwater environment that I am particularly, uh, you know, interested in. But um, I'm hoping through this listening and focused listening also towards the underwater creature, uh, it will give, and I mean, it's sort of also... Um, making us more aware of our immediate environment, you know, uh, around us, just outside the window, you know. I heard the local crow, he lives here uh, on the farm, was like really going at something. And so I was just walking around the house and I could see like a whole big group of this uh, sort of, uh, we call them kornkrake. Uh, they are big like ravens, but they have yellow beaks. I don't know what the name is in English. And there was a big group of them, about 10 or 15 uh, of them on the grass here, you know, they never been really around here, you know. And then, uh, you know, you had to have the local uh, wood pigeons. There's always like a wood pigeon couple in all the farms here. They have their own like wood pigeon couples. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, they come back every year. So I've been seeing like they've been mating out on the branch just outside the window here and they they came back like this year um the same ones that they're mating on the same branch though so this is like what makes is a good thing about being uh, sitting still in one place for a long time you start to notice these things you know and uh, i do believe that you know over time we uh, observation and sort of feeling connected to your environment, you know, it takes time and it takes to go back and back to an environment to say anything about it, you know, and get to know, uh, you know, so local people and talk to them and go back and back and back to places is, I think, it's the way we can start to, you know, feel um, connected to an environment and not just like coming and then do some work and, and leave again. We cannot really say anything about anything in that way, I think, really. So. Yeah. so one of the things that I wonder about is with this kind of process of revisiting environments, it, at the moment it feels like climate change is, is, is very present and very kind of visible, not necessarily visible, but but you know, something that we that we feel quite actively. Are there things that you've noticed when you've gone back and re-recorded environments that that have changed in the sort of the sonic environment that you've that you've recorded that you that is a result of climate change or just just that you've noticed changing over time? Yeah, you know you hear uh, stories from people you meet of mm -hmm. what was here. You know, in the, on the south coast of Norway, for example. Uh, when I was a child, um, we were fishing and we did get fish, you know, we got the variety of species uh, then. But of course, my granddad and there was like photographs of uh, much uh, larger fish, much larger biodiversity. Uh, at the moment, uh, there is hardly any uh, fish at all in this area. Nothing, you know. Right. And uh, this goes from the south coast of Norway in through the whole fjord to Oslo. It's, it is like quite dead, you know. There is, uh, it, it's really worrying, you know, and this it just keeps going on, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, ke it keeps happening and it's not getting any better at all. Um, so I see, I see that. Uh, and another thing I was just noticing also here being in my... Uh, my old my grandparents' house. Uh, my grandmother had these kind of um, uh, netting in the windows when we were airing uh, out for you know for ventilation. And you have this net in the window that you put because you had to do it because there were so much insects. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the other night I I slept with the window open and light on inside, and it was only one fly coming in. You know, yeah. this is really seriously worrying, you know. There is far, far, far less insects and this. So I don't really need these net windows anymore, you know. It's like, um, uh, or even you drive a car. And I do remember there was lots of insects on the car, you know, when you had driven for a trip. And now you don't have any insects on your car when you drive. I mean, mm -hmm. dead insects, of course. I mean, there's some are... So, so all you know, if you're looking around, then you you, you see things. That, 
it is very worrying to me and also that I can't hear the seabirds, you know, out at the coast. Mm -hmm. They are all in the city. You yes. Know? Yeah. Uh, they are there because it's easier access for food for them in the city than it is on the coast because there is no more fish, you know. Mm -hmm. And on the south coast of Norway, it used to be loads of, of seagulls. And if we were out fishing, you know, they were all around, you know, they were there, they were hanging with us when we were fishing. You know, this is really absolutely not happening. So it's very quiet and this is worrying me, you know. Mm -hmm. There should be a wild no, uh, an amount of sounds from seabirds and in the north of Norway this is also is crazy you know? mm -hmm. and, and, and now with um, with Covid you know it's said to be like more uh, quiet whatever you know but uh, I, around the coast of Norway it's like more noisy because people stayed in Norway this summer so they made they used their they, they had lots of people bought boats this summer yeah. Not thinking about the amount of, of sound that they are uh, producing for the f local fish, you know, the few that are left, you know, that will not absolutely not hear each other uh, because of this, you know. And uh, it's like the proportion of like the amount of sound that we make underwater uh, is going and there's less life that makes sound underwater. It, and this is the stress factors becomes too many, you know, and, and we need to make some, some action now, not just like talking about it. We have to actually change our ways drastically and mm. we need to do this. Uh, everyone like you and uh, me and everyone, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, and you know, I, I have this book uh, that uh, UNESCO book, which is uh, SOS for the planet that I got in 1972 and it's talking about the same things you know mm. that we are talking about now it just mm. takes too long I guess that's one of the things that that we can maybe use art for is making this stuff more kind of present and and yeah. and you know making people more aware of what's happening through art and it does feel like like your work has been doing that for for well a a while now but do you think there are other things that we should be doing that we aren't obviously yeah I think that particularly in the western world governments have have done an amazing job of somehow making this feel like it's our responsibility you know we need to go out and wash out all of our plastic containers and put them in the recycling bin and that's going to save the planet but you know are there are there sort of things that individually we can we can do to help kind of conserve these these sound environments do you think that was actually, there were several questions. It was, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking and talking at the same time. Yeah, it's yeah. a dangerous thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, because um, I will just comment on that because I do think that um, the fact that, you know, we are uh, recycling uh, stuff, we are becoming aware of how much plastic we are using in our daily uh, consumption of food, you know, for example, and by recycling and putting it in separate bins and all this, we are becoming aware of this uh, generally uh, more and more, you know, the, that, uh, you know, it might be better to not just buy something and throw it away, you know, but reuse things, repair things, you know, and as the attitude changes, this will also put pressure on the government and uh, the fact that uh, there are people that are sitting in these director positions in the companies and stuff like that and if the whole environment around you changes that this is not actually acceptable to have a container and uh, throw it away immediately after you have eaten something for one minute you know it's like um, I think it it is good also but of course uh, like you're saying that you kind of put the responsibility onto um, uh, individuals. Um, I think it needs to be all, everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. Like we need to have like, um, what do you call it? Uh, everyone engaged in this from the directors of the larger companies, um, you know, and the decision makers and uh, in the politics and the individual people, uh, we need uh, everybody now 
on what do you call it everyone on that for us uh, now it's just uh, there's no other way really in my opinion so um, yeah so okay. both politicians the actual uh, you know you and me and uh, you know the, the companies everyone really okay um can i ask you a little bit about specific works now briefly yeah. um so can you tell me a bit about um listening through the dead zones which i know you've got in, in russia in installation at the moment listening through the dead zones um is a commission from uh, ichma in uh, helsinki um, and I suggested uh, to work with this for this uh, particular commission because of the situation in the Baltic Sea. I have been recording a lot uh, around the Baltic Sea at other locations, and I'm a bit very curious about, you know, it's often said that the Baltic Sea is dead, you know, and, and what's, what does this mean, you know, because the, there is fish there, you know, there is fishing going on. Um, what is then the problem uh, in this area? So I started to ask more questions and I saw that, you know, th there is this massive problem with algae overgrowth there. Um, as it is here uh, at the Lake Mjosa, which was really my origin of being concerned with how we are treating the planet and uh, the creatures around us, that it was... Um, you know, these blooms of plankton and uh, and the cyanobacteria, you know, and the, how it is sort of using up the oxygen so it becomes impossible for uh, fish uh, to live in these areas. And, and, and this is happening in large uh, areas of the Baltic Sea. And, and these areas are called uh, dead zones when you have a measure of less than two milligrams oxygen per liter of water. It is defined as a dead zone in the Baltic Sea because there is quite a lot of fluctuation uh, of the, uh, the situations there uh, so uh, because it's changing this, the fish are not um, kind of adapting to a low oxygen uh, level so other places on the planet fish might be able to live with less oxygen, but this is like uh, two milligrams per liter as a limit really in the in the Baltic Sea. So I was thinking, uh, how are people then uh, around and uh, this area uh, thinking around it? So I was interviewing um, like a, a farmer and fishermen and uh, you know people dealing with this uh, problem, you know, uh, to sort of light on it and, and explain I mean a lot to understand that uh, myself so I could kind of talk about it um, so we found a um, location that I thought was uh, really good to use for this it was an old rolling stadium so the stadium was like there there were seats, seats and you could sit and look at the sea as you do when you look at a rowing competition of course <laughs> and uh, this was kind of closed off um, space uh, that people normally wouldn't uh, go to. There's like a fence around it. So, so it would be great to open this up and let people go and sit there and listen to uh, the sound environments uh, from different parts of the planet. So it's, uh, this is why I call it sort of listening through the dead zones, that you could sit there and listen to areas with um, a high biodiversity uh, or like a competition, not competition, a uh, composition that I made uh, there uh, on the site. Because I would always like to make the work on site to work with the existing town environment. And of course there, it was uh, strong winds at times. It was like hailing rain, you know. And uh, so I was sitting, but it was so nice under the roof there and working with this sound, the wind in the trees, you know, the waves slashing. Um, together with uh, the sounds that uh, I brought and and the comp uh, composition I have prepared, like you know, they have, they have a, the speaker set up still <laughs> here in the studio for uh, this eight speaker setup. It's like a model of the of the 14 speaker setup we had there. 
and I worked together with Tony Mayat uh, on the site um, there and also in the preparation. Uh, so uh, we very often work together on this large uh, sound installation. So it's a sort of great collaboration we have together now for more than 10 years. Uh, listening through the dead slows is uh, at the moment in uh, St. Petersburg during the, I mean, at the exhibition Hydra. And this has, uh, I couldn't travel there, you know, also, you know, COVID, other things. Uh, so, um, I planned it uh, to be uh, existing there without me going there. And, um, and so we have been collaborating on how to install the piece mm -hmm. and uh, made a kind of um, like a little sort of platform, like a little uh, amphi uh, to uh, sit on and to look out of the window um, and uh, listening to it on the headphone uh, situation. So we have okay. four headphones, and but they are placed such that you sit looking out towards the harbor uh, area. Um, and, um, you know, St. Petersburg is quite close to Helsinki. It kind of made sense to me to, uh, to connect uh, them because they're both uh, dealing with the issues of of these uh, dead zones and uh, uh, also of course the the sound pollution the shipping that goes out of St Petersburg all the time yeah. and um, so we it made sense to show the same piece but uh, in another uh, version of it. And um, I then mixed uh, the piece uh, right after I came from Helsinki into uh, a headphone um, a situation and uh, using the same headphones as I'm mixing on uh, in the installation. So I get more, you know, mm -hmm. know what it sounds like without really uh, being there. But it's important that you could look at the harbor and have a kind of visual re relation to the ocean as you do, did in Helsinki. At the, um, so it's, it's a sort of clear reference to that original piece, yeah. You have a residency coming up. Um, is, it, is the organization called Scale Travels or is the residency called Scale Travels? Scale Travels is the, is the resident, that series of, I'm, because it's like, a, it's also an exhibition. Okay. Yeah, so it's an exhibition I'll do. I have done a workshop. It's um, a concert, and it's all in relation to the residency at the uh, Nanotechnology Lab in Braga. Yeah, so I was really yeah. interested in how how are you actually using nanotechnology and what you're doing? And I, I realise you might not be able to tell me that yet because that might be all kind of hush-hush, but if there is anything you can tell us about that, that would be, be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. No, I'm uh, I am actually super excited about going into this enormously tiny scale now, like uh, <laughs> with the residency at the nanotechnology lab in Braga. Um, in October, uh, I'm going there, and um, well, I hope finally because it's been delayed of uh, several reasons, and recently because of COVID, and now I'm uh, hoping to be able to go there in October. Um, I. Uh, like I mentioned, with the oxygen, um, I have been come very concerned with, you know, what I actually also worked with when back in the days when I studied chemistry, uh, of course. And uh, I'm thinking about, you know, down to molecular size uh, of um, how oxygen is behaving and uh, how is uh, oxygen behaving uh, through different kind of, you know, like surfaces and uh, how is the acoustics even like uh, on the, in air bubbles, which of course in nano size and air bubble and water is massive yeah. and enormously big and underwater insects are enormously big you know? <laughs> <laughs> in, in the relation to nanoscale. So um, I am, uh, uh, continuing a project I've been working on for a long time, really, with the sound of underwater uh, insects. Mm. And um, I'm doing uh, uh, an exhibition also with them uh, in December, uh, usually. Uh, we, uh, or is it, yeah, December, no, uh, January? I don't sure. We haven't set a date yet, but um, 
uh, so it's it's like um, first I will just uh, go into the nanotechnology lab for you know to just uh, learn and look at uh, the very very small things. But I mean I'm interested in sort of exchange of oxygen and how creatures are um, you know get, getting oxygen out of the water kind of thing. Sure. Fantastic. Yeah. That sounds very cool. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun. One of the things that we've been kind of thinking about as part of this this sort of series of talks that we've been doing with, with different artists is your work has like a really kind of clear um, sort of environmental and ecological focus to it. But digital storage and, you know, computers and all that kind of stuff has a yeah. has a carbon kind of cost associated with it. So, yeah, obviously not the same as kind of manufacturing big things or sort of dealing with objects and plastics and that kind of stuff but there is still a like a an environmental cost there so how do you sort yeah. of how do you think about that and kind of conceptualize that in in the work that you're doing well, yeah i would say that um in terms of equipment that i use when i'm recording for example at least uh, it it is being i, I try to you know I have things that will last uh, long, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's both good and bad, you know, it's like it lasts, it uh, doesn't destroy very, very easily, but it makes me not having to buy new things. Yeah. So I, uh, I reuse now for many, many years, the same, uh, you know, recording equipment. Um, I still use uh, the recording equipment I bought like, you know, say whatever, 15 years ago. This is, uh, of course, a very short time as well. Yeah. So I'm not saying that that is necessarily at all good, but, um, and, you know, the speakers are very durable and I'm, you know, reusing, I found some that I really, really like the sound that works well. So I ask for the same speakers because I know what they sound like. I, they're in a rent locally. I have type of speakers that can be rented locally where, uh, uh, where I am. There has been, of course, this happened that I had to get to get the speakers sent from somewhere. Yeah. And uh, I mean, for example, with this recent project in Helsinki, we had a, um, a carbon footprint uh, calculation uh, of the whole project. Okay. And uh, they are starting to do that now. And, um, and I, I see that more and more uh, uh, art um, organizers uh, of events and stuff are starting to do that. They, uh, they look into, but I think that Ichme in Helsinki is one of the first ones that I know. Uh, that I really actually uh, they employed somebody to uh, to look actually look at the whole production of uh, uh, of the, the, my work and uh, and towards the, this installation and then but of course it's different ways of calculating the the, the you know our footprints um, but it's of course something I'm thinking about uh, a lot and. Um, yeah, it, it is, uh, it, yeah, <laughs> it's possible. It's possible <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to think in a way that, you know, when you do a project, you do several projects in the same area of the world if you have to travel. I think I, I, I will try to do that now, plan differently, you know, mm. uh, plan in the way that I would do several things in the same area. Um, so that you don't do like it was a bit crazy before I um, before COVID now in the terms of I was traveling like three times to Asia and two times to the state within a you know less than a year and that's like insane mm -hmm. no, that's not necessary and you just need to plan better yeah. uh, for example um but uh, yeah, uh, but you said uh, yeah. I think there is a lot to gain also in recycling the equipment we have. All the uh, but of course you know if you store things online, that's also uh, you know can also be problematic. But I, I guess if these 
this information. Uh, we need to do more research on what is the best solutions in that sense, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and make that available to people. Because I do think that people really like, want to, um, you know, do a thing, uh, but, uh, but often not knowing, you know, this. Um, but it's not further ago that than my, you know, my grand or my mother, you know, she's like repairing everything. She repairs her socks, you know, uh, yeah. in the in the closet here, like for from my grandmother. There is like you, you, you know, you reused and you repaired everything. It's just yeah. you didn't throw away clothes, you know. You just didn't. <laughs> You, you had things made with very good fabric uh, such that it lasts for like, you know, I am wearing my grandmother's coat that is from the 50s and it, it's still working totally fine, a woolen coat. And um, for example, that I have used for years now and she used for years. So it was like really good quality fabrics and stuff like this. That, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. It, it's actually all this kind of one-time usage. It's uh, from like what is it, mid seventies, or you know, when all the plastic started, and yeah. and I remember that being strange. Yeah. So you know, you had something that you a container for something that you threw away. That was weird. Yeah. I remember that actually. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like, oh yeah, you just. Fill up the whole bag full of plastic. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's strange as because mm. I grew up in the in the eighties. Yeah, I don't obviously don't really remember kind of plastics as being a new thing. They're always just a thing. Yeah. yeah. When you look back on it with kind of hindsight, um, you sort of think, how did how did it not occur to anyone at the time that in the future this might be a problem <laughs> like yeah. just the sheer volume of stuff yeah. that we're making that that doesn't biodegrade and that isn't going to go anywhere mm -hmm. and I can't actually do anything with like that, I think yeah no but I think that we did have many people in the 70s that were noticing this it was actually people are aware people in the 80s now that were uh, environmentalists uh, then and, and and I mean you know still are yeah, uh, and I mean, for example, my mother, uh, she has, um, she's telling me many, many times how she got, she was really worried when all this plastic came, yeah. and uh, we, she was thinking that this is not a, a good thing, you know, yeah. and there were there were many people with her, you know, and we had organizations that started like. Fremtid uh, Nivore Henner is an organization um, in Norway uh, that it is still going and now more younger people are also joining that. So it's not that this is like a new um, concern, it's just that now we are really seeing like the effect. Oh my God, I, I was just seeing uh, like uh, road building happening now in Norway. It's like these massive craters that they you know, are planning and are in the development of, of making all through like soil for food and forest and habitats that would be totally destroyed that, you know, the animals can't cross and drainage of um, swamp areas and stuff like that, uh, peat areas. And it, it's just in pain, you know, and in the light of this now, a lot of people are seeing that now. Mm -hmm. And and they are reacting and they have caused development at the, right now because okay. they are like a lot of people are putting pressure now because it just looks insane right now, you know. And this has to kind of keep uh, looking, you know, as it is. It's insane, these kind yeah. of ways of doing things. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, yeah, it's just, you know, I remember like, uh, you know, we used to have like this, you, you were building your house like down in the environment and uh, the cabins, you know, Norway is they crazy about cabins and they were built down in the environment to be invisible and not so intrusive on the environment. Yeah. But like the last decades, it's been like massive houses, like the cabins become like this, you know, 
you know, cutting down all the trees around and look, here I am, like this kind of idea. And it's just the opposite of what it was really in the, in, in the 70s when these uh, cabins were. As I remember it, but anyway, um, I'm, I'm hoping that this comes back and we stop this craziness. Or it's just, mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I do think that like that is, there is like an increased emphasis on kind of preservation and, and sort of more environmental thinking that's come out of COVID. So even just within academia, people are yep. starting to, to say, you know, we're not going to do conferences like international conferences in the same way anymore. We're not going to no. all fly to Chile or yep. New York yep. or wherever, yep. you know, we're going to keep this way of doing things because yep. you know, obviously there is a, a cost to doing stuff online, but nothing like the cost of, you know, 200 people getting on a plane. Yeah. Um, yep. So I think, I don't know how long that will last for, or whether it's just going to be this kind of immediate post COVID. Oh, now we can do things online, and then in ten years' time, we'll be back to everyone flying all over the place. But but isn't that yeah. it's up to us, though, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you and me and everyone, we just have to say no. I don't. I I'm not flying there, but I'm really happy to do it online. You know. Yeah. For, for sure. example, we we just have to all participate in that development. Yeah. I think. Yeah.